This week, the challenge is accepted as General Lee tries to save the Confederacy for the nth time in his career. The four years of war have taken a toll on everyone in this nation, but it could be over, as the rebellious Richmond is within our grasp. President Lincoln goes from the Commander-in-Chief to the People's President. All people. Last week in Virginia, General Robert E. Lee prepared his Petersburg withdrawal. His failure to clear the line of retreat has put him in a dire situation. General Pickett's force near Five Forks is the final defensive line before the Army of Northern Virginia is encircled. The possibility to end the enemy presence is a golden opportunity, and General Grant directs his support Sheridan and the V Corps under Gouverneur K. Warren to strike. General Warren has recently disappointed Grant with slowness, leaving his continued command on a knife's edge. An embarrassment could cost him his career, especially since President Lincoln is here to witness the battle. Sheridan plans a rapid strike, not even waiting for artillery. His cavalry under General Merritt are to charge the front and the Fifth Corps to strike the left flank. He and generals are ready to finally break through the enemy that has foiled them for the last four years. General Pickett is having a lovely fish bake with General Lee and Cavalry Commander Thomas Rosser, incorrectly assuming they had time before the storm. They failed to appoint a successor in their place. To make things worse for them, they are in an acoustic shadow, which makes it difficult to hear outside sounds. When the battle starts, they can't hear it. Their absence gives the Union Army a great victory as Officer McKenzie and his cavalry division overpower a foe greater than their size. They triumphantly trot forward. As the men get in place for the main battle, an urgent dispatch arrives. General Grant directs me to say to you, that if in your judgment the 5th Corps would do better under one of the division commanders, you are authorized to relieve General Warren and order him to report to General Grant at headquarters. Warren is unaware of this and continues to dutifully arrange his divisions. However, due to faulty intelligence, the grand assault is delayed, and the order to attack isn't given until after 4 p.m. 4.30, the sounds of carbine fire echo through the woods. General Sheridan personally leads a charge. With no overall commander, the Confederate brigades individually suffer the onslaught. Luckily for them, more confusion causes Crawford's division to be off course, causing Warren to have to chase it down. Nonetheless, the Union advances and the enemy line breaks. The rebels try to reform a line, but the losses inflicted have left regiments depleted. It's at this time that Pickett finally learns the situation and rides to his battered division, narrowly avoiding Crawford's skirmishers. His arrival is too late, and the desperate attempt to form a line fails as brigades break and men flee or surrender en masse. The killing blow is dealt as Crawford's command breaks a Virginia brigade. The gray shirts rout, and Custer charges in, ready to capture Pickett's mob, but is wanted by Rooney Lee's cavalry, who saves the souls of their infantry brothers. 9 p.m., Grant receives word of the victory. This is the opportunity. This is the tipping point, and this is what the president needs to see. Lincoln is dealing with his own issues at the moment. You see, much like how I started the series, Lincoln is a tall, scrawny man. His accommodations don't reflect his needs. Resting on the flagship, the Malvern, he finds his... Bunk was too short, and he was compelled to fold his legs the first night. Luckily, his host, Admiral Porter, orders the ship's carpenter to fix this, and on the third, Lincoln reports that he had shrunk... I shrank six inches length and about a foot sideways. Perhaps it's well that the Commander-in-Chief was busy, for the embarrassment of the aftermath of Five Forks overshadows its victory. Despite General Warren leading the Fifth Corps to the greatest victory of the Petersburg Campaign, Sheridan replaces him with General Crawford. Insulted by this injustice, Warren will resign his commission and demand an inquiry into the incident, which will take decades for him to be cleared. Nonetheless, the war goes on. Five Forks has lost at least 3,000 soldiers. He desperately needs them, and as well forced his hand, the abandonment of the Petersburg line will be a messy one. Then he receives word from President Davis, No progress has been made in raising black troops. There is no trust from the civilian or military leaders of the Confederate states. We will have to fight off Grant with only the men he has, a shadow of the force that terrified this nation. Grant is cautious of reports regarding the disastrous state of his rival, wishing to both cover the exposed force of General Sheridan from counterattack, and to take advantage of the victory, orders a night-long artillery bombardment of the enemy line in an assault the early morning of the 2nd. This is to be an attack on all sides. 
4.30, General Park peers through the dark, watching his core advance on Fort Damnation. The cool blackness is soon lit as fire is traded before the two sides. The roar of artillery mixes with the yelling of orders as the final battle of Petersburg begins. Park's attack on the Far East is soon joined as General Wright charges his 6th Corps. General Getty's division leads the assault as his men charge into the enemy line held by General Wayne's Carolinian. Seeds more reminiscent of brutal medieval age battles and modern conflict, the two sides fight hand to hand. 20 minutes of bayonet and musket butt, of sword and spade. Those 20 minutes end with Lee's line cut in two. A.P. Hill's corps has been isolated from the rest of the rebel army and has part of the 6th Corps bearing down on his rear. The other parts of the 6th Corps have turned and moved to strike Petersburg proper. Just as it seems all hope is lost for the Army of Northern Virginia, it gets worse for them. 2nd Corps charges past the division. And two hours later, we've won. The entire western flank has fallen. Hoping to rally his men, General Hill rides out. General Lee had only ordered a colonel to reconnoiter, but the general decided to join. A fatal choice. The Union infantry man stumbles forward. The battle has shaken their senses. They look up and see a gray man on horseback. He raises his rifle, pulls the trigger. Lee's third lieutenant falls down dead. By 10 a.m., the Confederates have fallen back to their main Petersburg line. With only two major fortifications, Gregg and Whitworth, We looks out. Longstreet holds, but General Field's division is late. No matter what, his days are numbered. With a heavy heart, he sends a telegram to Richmond. I see no prospect of doing more than holding our position here until night. I'm not certain I can do that. I cannot shall withdraw to night north of the Appomattox, and if possible, we better to withdraw the whole line tonight from James River. I advise that all preparations be made for leaving Richmond tonight. I'll advise you later according to circumstances. A messenger rushes to one of the kneeling practitioners in the holy halls of St. Paul's Episcopal Church. He hands him a personal message. President Davis reads it with growing horror. He stands up and immediately leaves. Not even God can save him. A minor counterattack buys an hour, but soon Fort Gregg finds itself under assault. A nearby Fort Owen has artillery. Gregg, none. When Owen is captured, Commander of Confederate Forces, Colonel Owen, huh, I wonder who named Fort Owen, orders his men to open fire, hoping to recapture the threatening artillery piece. Rebels succeed and bring the cannon into their fortification. Don't let this small back and forth fool you. Rebels' goal right now is just to buy time with the rank and files alive. Rebel General Wilcox orders his brigade to move to Fort Craig. Both sides begin to move men forward. What commenced was a brutal struggle, completely devoid of the perceived Napoleonic-esque beauty in our imaginations. Wounded men drown in the blood of the corpses they once called friends. Dying men hold in their intestines, just prolonging the pain. Ultimately, Craig and Whitworth fall to the Union. The remaining rebels fall back to the Dimmick line. General Park, whose 9th Corps started this battle, calls for reinforcements, having made little headway since the start. The bloody clash has been centered on Fort Mahone, with portions of the fort just changing hands. When reinforcements arrive, the Union does secure Mahone. Further to the west at Sutherland Station, the Union mops up. General Nelson breaks the battered division of General Heth, cuts off the last supply line of Petersburg. The battle only ends with the complete exhaustion of both sides, sapping the ability to fight. 3 p.m. Lee gives word to his men. It is time to leave. By sunrise tomorrow, Petersburg and Richmond should not have a single defender. Grant plans an assault for the third. It's called off when reports come in the enemy have left. Back-to-back -back losses at Five Forks and Petersburg mean the army that entered the defensive lines differed greatly from the ones that left them. All that cannot be brought is destroyed, which means all of Lee's heavy artillery was spiked and left behind. Cotton warehouses were set alight. The Union occupied Petersburg raising the flag. Outside Richmond, General Weitzel orders the men of the Massachusetts Cavalry to receive the surrender. Mayor Joseph Mayo in a carriage hands over a document requesting the Union take possession to protect the city. The Cavalry raised the flag. The U.S. Colored Troops march in to receive the formal surrender. The war is nearing its end. But let's just take a moment to appreciate what has happened so far. Lee has been forced from his defenses after losing one of his top generals and effectively 10,000 men. He has no backup defensive line. The capital is lost. This isn't Russia pulling back in the face of Napoleon. This is a defeated pseudo-state refusing to recognize reality. Grant and Lee confer, deciding to take their exhausted army 
cut off Lee's escape, and force reality on the rebels. The Union marches at the breakneck pace to reach the enemy. The Corps split to intercept the Army of Northern Virginia and protect their own lines. Rebels move to regroup at Amelia Court House. While the forces north of the Appomattox River have an easy time of this, the cavalry of Fitzhugh Lee and General Anderson are south of the river. General Custer charged down the fleeing Confederates of Fitzhugh Lee. Rebel rearguard was quickly overwhelmed, and the Union seemed ready to exploit their victory. But the victory of Bushrod Johnson held firm. On the 4th, the rebels arrive at Amelia Court House and begin to wait. 300,000 rations are expected to arrive by rail. They will never be seen. A breakdown in orders cost the Confederates one day. Lee sends out men to receive food from the locals, promising payment and vouchers. But there's little to give, and any vouchers are worthless. Once again, the Army of Northern Virginia cuts down on its weight. Artillery is reduced, and wagons are broken down. Four Confederate commanders arrive, and all will be at Amelia in the early hours of the 5th. But this delay has doomed them. The same day, the Union takes great action. First General Park, who is furthest, takes over Burkeville, cutting off the lines of retreat south. And further north, Sheridan's advance guard takes the telegraph office at Jettersville, intercepting a message for 200,000 rations. He tries to trick the Confederates into sending the supplies to Sheridan. Of course, that all pales in comparison to the great symbolic victory. Lincoln has had a marvelous week, from receiving the trophies of war to the updates from General Grant. But the fourth, the most significant one yet. He enters Richmond, walks into the Confederate White House, and takes a seat behind Davis's desk. Next day doesn't go as swimmingly. The fifth, Secretary of State Seward is injured, thrown from his carriage, his left to smoke cigars, has caused the gentleman to put himself in grave danger. He is brought to his home unconscious. Lincoln receives word of this late, having spent the day speaking with former Supreme Court Justice and current Assistant Confederate Secretary Campbell. Lincoln is unwavering in his need for restoration of the Union and the ending of slavery. Returning to the battlefield, the 200,000 rations are being moved under the care of what? Are you sure? Black Confederates! Well, maybe. It's disputed if they are some of the companies recruited in Richmond, or they are enslaved who rushed to pick up muskets. Or if they even picked up muskets. What we do know is that the 1st New Jersey cavalry brushes over them and destroy the wagons they were guarding. New Jersey cavalry is soon counterattacked, but the damage is done. The Confederates fall back and continue without whatever wagons they have left. Lee's position is terrible. The Union has constantly arrived first where he needed to go. With his back to the Appomattox River, his march must be quick. But the train is no friend, and at Sailor's Creek, he is slow to a snail's crawl, allowing the Union to attack. The first strike is at High Bridge. Grant had predicted Lee's attempt to turn south. Union skirmishers wait across the river, taking on the rebel rear guard. Sheridan soon arrives, having his cavalry hit and run across the Confederate columns. General Ord sends a force to High Bridge directly and orders it burned. Reports get back to Lee and Longstreet. If the bridge is burnt, they will be trapped. The Confederate cavalry is sent out to stop the bridge burning, even if it costs all their lives. This desperation is surprisingly matched by the Union. Pennsylvania and Ohio infantry fire until their ammunition is spent, and still they stand. The Mad Rebels close in, charging the front and flanks, encircling our men, and still they stand. Company commanders take over the attempt to cut their way out. But with Sabre, the Blue Boys are cut down. The bow reaches the bridge proper, and there, the sacrifices of all our men for naught. The bridge is saved. Lives lost for a line of retreat to remain open. They will be avenged. The ferocity of the fight caused the Confederates to entrench around Rice's station, allowing our men to catch up fully with them. Minor skirmishing occurred against Longstreet's men. Both sides were unsupported, but Longstreet was supposed to be. As the remaining whacking train moved through the rain, General Crook's Federal scouts observed the movement. More importantly, were observed themselves. Anderson's corps slows down to protect the wagons, causing a gap. General Pickett is ordered to throw up breastworks to hold the Federal troopers back. As Crook calls the attention, General Custer takes advantage, charging into an unguarded artillery battalion. Pickett spots this and forces Custer back. As Lussar rides away, he smiles, knowing that the Union will win the day. General Wright and the 6th Corps soon arrive on the scene, and their presence causes the rebel line to fracture. General Gordon acts as rear guard, which brings him into the path of the 2nd Corps under General Humphreys. Joe Anderson crosses Little Sailor's Creek, fighting himself against more Federal cavalry. 
General Yule, watching as the wagons are whisked away, realizes he would have to make a hasty stand. There's only 4,000 men to call a court. His best hope is a small hillside across from the little creek. There's little more than a muddy stream of water. The terrible position isn't lost on Yule, who writes General Anderson to decide on strategy, whether to unite or attempt a fighting withdrawal separate. The decision is made for them as the Sixth Corps advances towards Yule's Hill. Likewise, General Anderson finds himself under assault as General Merritt prepares his pre-cavalry divisions. He and artillery opens a general bombardment against the Confederate line, which goes unanswered as Custer had finished the rebel cannons. After a 30-minute bombardment, the Union infantry begins their advance, pushing their way through skirmishers and crossing the creek. The ascent starts as a Confederate volley is fired, the disorganized Union line reels, and with great jubilation, the Confederates counterattack. This is a mistake. They chase the forward Union line back to the creek and engage in brutal hand-to-hand -hand conflict which further degenerates into biting and wrestling. But as the chaos sorts itself out, as the two lines become clear, cannons switch to cancer shot and blast through the rebels, forcing them back to their breastworks. As this is happening, the Union cavalry charges into Anderson's corps, striking the flanks and trampling over the front lines. Every time they are repulsed, they come back in force, begin to wear down the enemy line. When they break, the cavalry does its job. The retreating greys are cut down. Those who stayed are encircled and forced to surrender. With them is their officers. Yule's overrun. Joe Kershaw is overrun. Black Thursday it is called. Yule's Corps surrenders. 3,250 men. Another 150 killed or wounded. It is wiped from the face of the earth. Joe Anderson gets out lucky. Of the 6,300 men he began with, 2,600 became casualties. That's not all. The Second Corps engages in a running battle with General Gordon, continuously overrunning the rear, capturing men in battle flags. This continues until the Confederates are forced back all the way to their wagon trains to form a final battle line. Two of Humphrey's divisions finish them off, forcing them from the wagons. Many attempt to reach high ground, others run for Farmville. The mass surrenders begin. The Second Corps takes 1,700 prisoners, 13 battle flags, three cannons, and over 300 wagons, and 70 field ambulances. Through the actions of this one day, one-fifth of Lee's army surrendered. He has also lost eight generals, including Yule. Only once the battle begins to subside, can old Robert truly understand the disaster that has befallen him? Running towards the rear of his column with General Mahone by his side. My God, has the army dissolved? No, General. Here are troops ready to do their duty. Yes. There are still some true men left. Will you please keep those people back? The Union's reaction was the polar opposite. General Sheridan sends a report back to Lincoln at City Point. The thing is pressed, I think, that we will surrender. Let the thing be pressed. Lee desperately tries to gain distance between his army and the pursuers, planning to burn bridges behind the retreating army. As he plans escape, he receives a question from Davis. Is there even a goal for the military at this point? No, I shall have to be governed by each day's developments. A few more sailors' creeks and it will all be over. His immediate goal is to feed his men, so he moves towards Farmville, where rations lie. When the army does arrive, they descend into a frenzied feast, scarfing down any sustenance they can. Lee knows it's only a matter of time before they will have to flee again. With some prodding, Lee rests. As the army of Northern Virginia is broken apart piece by piece, another actor enters the state though it is not a savior of Lee's forces. Union General Stoneman dismantles the land before him, leaving nothing of use. General Lee plans a closely guarded crossing of High Bridge. The issue with this plan comes from a miscommunication of orders, as the division of William Mahone is not allowed to pass. This enables the Second Corps to catch up, stop the destruction of High Bridge. Union continues a running battle with the rear guard. When the rebels reach Farmville, they turn and begin a battle in earnest, killing General Smith, brave Union boy. Winning the skirmish, further attempts to turn the rebel line fail. More of our men are captured as the Union suffers its first defeat in a while. Nevertheless, General Grant knows he has Lee beat. He sends word to be his adjutant general, Seth Williams. General, the results of the last week must convince you of the hopelessness of further resistance on the part of the Army of Northern Virginia in this struggle. I feel that it is so and regard it as my duty to shift from myself the responsibility of any further 
effusion of blood by asking of you the surrender of that portion of the CS Army known as the Army of Northern Virginia. When Lee receives the message, his heart is heavy. He believes the position has been lost and his men are as good as dead. He has the note to General Longstreet. Not yet. Lee writes a reply saying he also wishes to stop the flow of blood, but that the situation isn't as hopeless as Grant believes. With that, he begins another night march into next week. With defeat days away, the Union cavalry moves to mop up their once rivals. General Wilson targets the resources of war, mines, and factories. The only man in his way is the infamous General Nathan Bedford Forrest. Though his reputation as a cavalry commander has begun to wane after recent defeats, the Devil Force luck doesn't change as his underquipped and undermanned forces beaten in quick succession, allowing Wilson's raiders to burn as they wish. That is until Selma. Those are determined to hold the city long enough to properly evacuate. They do, but at a terrifying cost. General Richard Taylor takes the last train out, watching as the cotton he burned whites the faces of his federal foes. The Union finishes off the city, raising it to the ground, reminiscent of the images of Attila the Hun, though Wilson did order a complete ban on looting. The warning is clear, and Confederate Governor Thomas Watts evacuates Montgomery, with the army broken. Alabama is burning from Huntsville up north to South Mobile. Since a decisive naval victory last year, the city has been under siege, but the Union has only recently tightened its grip. The dueling fortifications of Blakely and the creatively named Spanish Fort, because the Spanish initially built the fort, are surrounded. By the end of the week, both hold on by a knife's edge. Ending this week with state politics, first, Connecticut has a gubernatorial election, in which the incumbent Republican Buckingham wins against the Democrat Seymour. Not his old rival Thomas Seymour, but Oregon Seymour. This victory is even greater than the 1864 one. Another victory, Tennessee ratifies the 13th Amendment on the 7th, bringing the number to 20 of the 27 needed. Sickles time. I would like to point out that his use as a diplomat is not uncommon for a military man. Conference between nations was common for officers before this dreadful war. The fame gained by our generals is obviously not worth the cost in blood, but it can bring us in higher regard among the nations. That's where the week ends and it ends with Lee's last days as a leader. Though the final action of his battle with Grant ended in a federal loss, let's take an honest look at the week. In the course of seven days, two of his three chief lieutenants were lost, be they killed as Hill or captured like Ewell. The numbers alone tell the story as Lee's army can number no more than 29,000. But that doesn't tell it in full. The army's regiments are without proper leadership, which goes all the way to the core level. Brigades on paper are the size of companies. The disarray runs all the way down. We has no choice but to surrender. The only question is, how many men must die before he finally gives in? Hi, I'm Jonathan Teagan, the entire Civil War Week by Week team. And we are coming towards a close. The exact week where this ends, I won't say, but the title of that episode will let you know. I started this series about four years ago. I started in my bedroom in Illinois as a high school student. Now I am a college student in my basement. I have never truly realized how lucky I am to be able to do this, to have people watch to have all the great help among the way, from YouTubers, from commenters. I just want to thank you all for being with me on this journey. Thank you.